Let's see. All right. We are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seattle Queer Film Festival Q&A session for Disruptor Conductor. I am John Terman, and I play French horn in the Seattle Symphony. I'm also a huge film fan, and I am super excited to welcome Daniel Bartholomew Poiser, the subject of Disruptor Conductor. Welcome, Daniel. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing well, John. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, it's the middle of the day. I'm, I'm taught for like three hours online. You know, this whole Zoom vibe, loving it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, what are you up to today? Having a good one? Uh, you know, today um, today was pretty somber in Toronto. Gray, overcast, low, uh, COVID shutdown, nothing's open. Uh, so I walked around a lot and read uh, James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room. And that's the extent of the day. And I will, after this, do some work. <laughs> Solid. Yeah, it's been a very, it's very gray, very gray in Toronto today. In well, many luckily, we, we got a little bit of sun here in Seattle, but yeah, the, wow. this week it's been just as like doom and gloom. Well, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I guess I, I had a couple of questions um, written down here. Um, just, uh, I, I think while we're waiting on Sherrod, or um, just in the meantime, um, what are you working on? What's what projects are coming up? As COVID nineteen kind of slowed that down, are you working now, or um, what do we got going on in your life? Well, there's a lot happening right now. In fact, tomorrow the Toronto Symphony will be releasing uh, the project that we've been working on for the past three weeks, which is a found footage horror movie slash concert. So it's basically the Blair Witch Project meets the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, uh, a Halloween show for young people and for schools and for kids, also for adults. So it's spooky, not it's not really scary. You know, there's jump scares and stuff, but it's fun, uh, spooky, scary. It's it's a 45 minute movie movie concert, and it's a new thing in it's a new genre that we're we're trying to create. I think that we have created because I haven't seen anything quite like it yet. And that's what we've been working on. Um, scripting, writing, acting, and basically taking a movie, the, like, you know, all the tropes of a horror movie and putting them together with a concert and seeing what we come up with. So that's, that comes out tomorrow. And we're still doing last minute things on it right now, but that's uh, that's coming out tomorrow. So that's the, been the big project. We're really, really proud of what we've done with that. Awesome. Wow. Well, I mean, just seems like you've like the life of a conductor is very busy. And I feel like in uh, Disruptor Conductor, it's represented pretty well. You know, we're especially um, dealing, not dealing with, but, you know, working with Thorgy Thor. And, um, you know, it reminded me of like working with a rock musician or working with um, these like really big acts where you kind of have to rely on like the last minute uh, rehearsal and like the writing and with um, your work in this, you know, edutainment field, which like this concert was kind of the first that I had seen of that, you know, an educational uh, pop show with uh, queer iconography, you know, Thorgy Thor. Um, I I just kind of want to, like, what was the process like for you d developing that program? Was it all you and um, no, okay. <laughs> How did it happen? So, uh, Symphony Nova Scotia, <coughs> it's just a regular cough, not a bad cough. Everything's okay. Um, Symphony Nova Scotia, I've been working with them for quite a while. And they called me and they said, hey, um, do you think this is something that could work, a drag concert? And I thought about it. I said, yeah, I think it can work. And in talking with Thorgy, Thorgy, from just all of her years working Brooklyn drag, has so many different ideas about how just things to do on stage like the uh, a walk-off competition and quick change competition, all this sort of stuff. And then I, as a result of um, being a pops conductor, being an education conductor, just being a conductor conductor, have ideas about the flow of uh, a two-hour orchestral show with intermission, like what that needs to feel like going through. But then also as a result of being a teacher, I thought of ways that we could have it be, I'm going to say informative, while we went along, um, one of the real, a great principle of education is to not let people know when education has started or when education's begun. Because then it's like, oh, you know, we're being taught stuff. Now, you know, that's really boring. 
So we just put things in along the way, like a little bit of queer history there, a little bit of Canadian queer history there, a little bit of um, activism work there, a hug here, just like in, in as, as entertaining a way as possible. So I think that was my contribution to the show. Um, but both of us together were able to really make, I think it's a really special show. It's a really, really special show. And I'm really glad to, to have been the, the inaugural one to perform that with Thorgy. I, I absolutely, that was like, I had been anticipating that show, you know, we heard about it, you know, on RuPaul's Drag Race and she was saying, oh, I want to start the Thorkestra. And it yeah. looks like we actually have a, we have a question. Are there any plans to do a world tour or even a North American tour with Thorgy and the orchestra, of course, probably post COVID, um, <laughs> when we're able to make music in person again with a live audience? Yes. So, uh, Gin Palm 007, what you need to do is get <laughs> on the email to your local orchestra and say, we would like to see this show. Because I can, you know, I talk to orchestras and say, hey, we have this show, it's great, it's sold out everywhere that we've done it, blah, blah, blah. But when people from the public say, hey, we'd like to hear the show as well too, then that's when orchestras really pay up and pay attention. So we are, I mean, we're doing a bunch of places next year. Uh, we had a bunch of places planned this year, but you know what happened. So yeah, I don't know if a world tour is kind of gonna, it's going to happen, but we will tour the tour the world with it, if that makes sense. Like, we, I don't think we're going to do, you know, seven months straight back to back, but we'll go, we're going to take it places. So coming soon to Gin Palm or Gin Palm 007. <laughs> Gin Palm, Mew Mew Mew. I don't know what I'm pitching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're, they're going to be TikTok famous after this. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. I, let's, I have another couple questions written down. Oh. So in the film, we get this glimpse of your music ed philosophy and I totally vibe with it too. I'm very much of like, make it edutainment. Not, it's not like, it should be very fun for like everyone to engage no matter what level you're educating or what level the concert is. Um, I'd love to just kind of hear you expand on your own like personal music ed philosophy. Like what age, like what would you change about um, music education if you could? Hmm. Uh, I would like make it, it more accessible. Yeah. I'd make it more accessible, make it part of the timetable in schools generally. Um, it's, you know, and I'm not, I'm not wanting to call anybody out, but it's a, it's a subject that you can time and it, in schools, you can timetable it out. You can make it such a way that it's totally impractical for students to take it. Um, so I would love to see more students have access to it. I'd love to see in Canada, you know, sometimes students are allowed to take the instruments on buses. So they can't take the instrument home, so they can't be involved in music because they can't take an instrument on a bus. Um, I'd like to see rules like that changed, basically. It's about access. And that doesn't mean that everyone, I mean, not everybody can be, you know, first clarinet in the band. And for those students, though, well, there's football for those people and, and basketball, right? There, there are other things they can do. <laughs> but um, if everybody had access, I think it would be a really fantastic way for young people to become involved in music, not just in listening to it, but also in playing. So I would want there to be more access across the board. Then also I would like us to um, involve students and play, as, even as students are learning, music from other cultures, because it's fun. Because, you know, if, if there are pieces of like reggae and hip hop and stuff like that, alongside the Bach, the Beethoven and the Brahms, and yes, there must be Bach, Beethoven and Brahms, um, as part of the education, then I think it's just more fun. A lot of uh, students will relate a lot more to music that they hear coming from their own cultures. And I think there's easy and simple ways to do that. And that's a lot of the work that we're seeing in music education right now. It's becoming diverse. We're holding on to the things that we've always had and adding new things so that the music that's on the stands of the children reflects the children who are actually in the classroom. And that's the movement that's already happening um, all, over, all over Canada, all over the United States, I think as well too. Yeah. So that's where I'd like to see uh, diversity of music and music education and greater ac access to music education, which looks like funding. <laughs> yes, it does look like funding, but man, like that, that would be so much fun. I'm even thinking like what I wish I would have learned is, you know, Carnatic singing and like all of these other like musics of other cultures or music of First Nations. It's all of these things that we need to now work to bring back to, you know, the heart of music in a, in a city, which can be, a, can be the symphony. Let's see, we've mm -hmm. got a question from, from Chris. What dream projects have you, <laughs> haven't you had the chance to do yet? So what, what, give us like your top dream projects um, <laughs> in the, um, the education community engagement, you know, drop down. Right. 
Well, I won't. I I'll, I have to be vague because as Chris, you know, who is this this mystery Chris? Yeah. Oh. You know, another conductor who's going to be taking is my coaching ideas. ideas. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, that's just, that's such a joke. Seriously, um, what I love is intersectionality of concerts uh, of orchestral music with basically anything. So I would love to do, and I, I'm, we're working on a concert um, about music and architecture, for example. So basically, if you take look at the architecture of a building, usually a building is designed according to an aesthetic principle, even if it's just a block of concrete with one window or whatever. There's an aesthetic principle there. And usually if you take that aesthetic principle, you can find um, a correlative principle in music. So music that sounds like a building or a building that sounds like a certain piece. That's always been really interesting to me. Um, that sounds like a bit arcane. That might be like, but you, there are ways to make that fun and, and, and entertaining. Uh, stuff like that, you know, um, I would love to do, we're, I'm actually, I'm going to be doing a reggae concert with uh, Jamila, who is a Nova Scotian uh, reggae artist that's happening in February. I believe that's one concert. I love horror. So I'm really, really proud of this last um this last project with, with the TSO, with Toronto Symphony Orchestra, bringing together real horror film with you know orchestral music uh, in a new way, in a movie concert. It's like, is this a movie? Is this a concert? We don't can't tell what's going on here. I'm really, really proud of that. So I wanna do more stuff like that. I'd like to, um, especially now because as orchestral musicians, we're competing with Netflix on their platform. It's really important that we take advantage of all the advantages <laughs> of um, of the medium, of the film medium. So more, bigger, better, more production value for concerts, more narrative, deeper narrative, better acting, better props. Um, one go further in, the, in that direction and bring orchestral music to the world in uh, to laptops and to television screens in different new fun ways. Wonderful answer. <laughs> Oh, hi, Sharon. Hey, everyone. Hi. <laughs> this is Sharon Lewis, the director of Disruptor Conductor, a wonderful Canadian filmmaker and producer. Welcome to the chat. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Daniel. You've never hi, known me. <laughs> we are so excited about this film being in this festival. We really are. Yeah, we are psyched. And, you know, during COVID and all of that, there's always that heartache that, you know, you've poured so much work into telling a story and putting it together and getting people together across the country, and then no one's going to see it. So we're really, really grateful, really happy. Well, I have to say um, I am very biased, but it was my favorite film of the festival because I am an orchestral musician. You missed the whole, like, look at this. Oh, I, I play French horn in the Seattle Symphony, so I'm just like, what? what? That's <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, did you say that it's your favorite film? Uh, yeah, it's my favorite <laughs> film ever. Like, <laughs> ever. Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely like, it's, it, it was, it really made me happy to watch. It felt, it reminded me like, as an orchestral musician in COVID times, we've been shut down for yeah. months and months and months and no audience. And it just like, I, you know, I was very emotionally moved by mm. watching the reaction from the audience and just remembering that feeling because it feels so far away for me. Mm. And it, was, it, it really, it made me feel so happy to watch. And so I, mm. I'm very thankful for you guys too, for all of your hard work on it. <laughs> And so that means you understand that whole behind the scenes stuff with Thorgy, with Thorgy Thor and sort of the orchestral culture and the Thorgy mm -hmm. Thor culture. And Daniel did such a beautiful job of integrating those two. That was the part when, uh, when we were filming it, we were like, this could go this way or this could go that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and if you watch the film, you'll know what we're talking about. There are moments where that clash of cultures really, it's um, its quite evident, you know, and there's some dangling that, uh, mm -hmm. that Daniel has to do. I, of course, as a filmmaker, was loving the drama. Yes, this is something Sharon always said, oh you know. Oh, my God. Oh, Daniel, don't worry. When when it's hard for you, it's better for us. It's better for the film. Oh, oh you're God, no. you need to get that on on film. Oh, you're ha oh, he's having a nervous breakdown. Oh, you need to get that <laughs> like, on film. Oh, we're putting in this <laughs> jacket before the rehearsal. Oh, let's get that on film. Oh, 
No, my my heart was like pounding during that scene where it's like, where's Thorgy? Where like it's an hour. We right? are are we even right? going to rehearse with her? Like I oh, like no. I have been saying that. So like I've I, oh my gosh, it was just <laughs> yeah. As an and it was sort of like Daniel described to me. You know, it's just a different kind of mindset. Like when you're doing drag, there's just a different kind of mindset that happens. And with orchestra, like I remember at some point I said to him, and you'll so get this done. I said, well, just just hold the orchestra. And he was like, <laughs> you foolish person. Like that doesn't happen. You don't hold an orchestra. Hold. Well, yeah, of course, because of all the you know, orchestras are very um, heavy union organizations. So it's like you have to meet that certain time. And so uh, that's, you know, with like Thorgy, you know, being I, I was comparing her to being a rock musician. And most of the time it's kind of a similar vibe where it's like, oh, we can kind of show up late and just kind of chill, whatever, like yeah. rehearsal it too, like pff, show up at four, get the show, it'll be fine. Yeah. But it's funny because yeah. Thorgy is Thorgy holds both worlds. So Thorgy transits between code switches, really, between drag world of like, okay, 7:30 show, I'll do and I, I don't know what time she'd show up for 7:30 show in Brooklyn. That's way too early for Thorgy in Brooklyn, anyways. Like 11 30. Yeah, what am I, what am I even <laughs> saying? Like, sorry, I'm, I I grew up in the prairies, right? So but uh but then but then I mean, yeah, you know, she was, I think like we weren't sure what was happening for that first one, but I've now done 10 shows with Thorgy, and Thorgy's an orchestral musician. Like Thorgy is an orchestral musician, right? So it's just like bam, 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 bam. And to be, and we're lucky that we got that first little blip of stuff happening because the reason that she was uh, late was because it was the first time she was doing like four costume changes in like twenty minutes or whatever for the first uh, for the for the first act of the show. Just, just crazy. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it speaks to, it's the first orchestral drag show ever in Canada. So that show really was, and that was the first one that we had filmed. So, that, you know, it was working out its kinks. And I think the thing with Thorgy that I was moved by, um, that you can see, is that she really takes seriously her uh, music and her studying mm -hmm. and, you know, bringing in that classical world. But I think what makes it interesting is she doesn't leave out the drag. You know, she doesn't just all of a sudden forget about that. Like it really is an integration of both cultures. And I think mm -hmm. both Daniel and Thorgy created something magical, especially for a queer audience to be in that situation where they are being welcomed, where they are being spoken to in a way that they're not necessarily always spoken to. Yeah. And it, it speaks back to the theme of the film where showing up is your full self in an orchestra, which is something I very much relate to. I uh, played in the Dallas Symphony and experienced a lot of homophobia in the workplace, frankly. And when I moved to Seattle, it was a very welcoming and like completely different place. And I was able to show up very fully. And to hear, Daniel, to hear you speak about that in the film was, uh, it, it just really like reminded me, wow, this is, I'm not the only one. This is, yeah. this is where I'm supposed to be and I'm showing up fully. And so, I I, I kind of I had two questions for Sharon. I I want to know like what what brought you to uh, this project and what connected you and Daniel and how did that um, project start out? I'm really curious on on that. Well, I have to say that um, I met Daniel at the premiere of my film in Toronto, Brown Girl Begins, which is this Afrofuturist film, and what Daniel came in. What's it called? Sorry, Brown Girl Begins. Oh. Com. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Afrofuturist film. And Daniel was, you know, I'm running around like crazy. And Daniel came in and he swept in. And I felt like I had met my brother. You know, he was just like, let me do this and I can help with this. But what I found really interesting, and this is my own biases, I looked at him and I was like, you look like me. You sound like you could be part of my family, but you're from a whole world that I don't understand and that I have never personally had a connection to. And in my mind, they were straight white men. That's the orchestral world. That's the, the world that, that Daniel was coming from. So I was really intrigued to meet him who was fully himself and was openly gay. And yes, I am black, you know, and yes, I am from the prairies. And yes, I love classical music. And um, and I was intrigued by that, and I wanted to see what that world was like. And he was my funnel into that world. And you know, the, there's a concert in the film 
for sure the Thorgy Thor concert was everything. But there's a concert in the film um, where it's the drummer from Black Panther. And I remember, I remember that moment sitting in the audience uh, and, and directing the film and being actually moved by the music, like really moved by the music. And it was at that moment that I got what Daniel was doing and what music could do. And when I opened myself up to music that I didn't think was about me or speaking to me, my world opens up. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope that the film does, you know, that people with the biases that I have who think that music isn't for them get opened up you know, really, really find their way in. And I think that's Daniel's gift. You know, it's why when he goes to a prison or why when he's, you know, working in the in San Francisco with this Afrocentric viewpoint on this concert, he's able to kind of open up people's world. And I know that's cliche and I know that's what music's supposed to do, but it really does work. It absolutely does. I. I that that concert in San Francisco too. I mean the hand drum, it's like or the singing drum, it's I, I've got chills when you're describing the moment actually. I don't know, it's like that <laughs> that ASMR or whatever, but um the but the power of music to open up to um more and more audiences. We were uh speaking a little bit earlier about access and about um how this type of programming is changing what classical musician or what it means to be a classical musician and what um, you you can also be an ambassador to many different cultures depending on how open you are to that mm -hmm. type of change and I I have a, <laughs> like um, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more on uh, or let, let me just double check the chat real quick sorry y'all <laughs> This is okay. From Mary Kate Reed, we have a question. Uh, given that your passions are focused about bringing people together, have you found ways to build community during the pandemic? That's for both of you, I'll say. That's an interesting question because, as you were saying, you missed, and I imagine Daniel too, you missed that live interaction. You missed that feedback from audiences, um, that, that, that symbiotic relationship that feeds you and goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. What I will say is that on this side of being able to present this story, in some ways we're able to reach bigger communities and mm -hmm. more communities because we are online. You know, so there are ways that um, that you can bring community around each other in a way that logistically might have been tougher mm -hmm. to do in a physical way. But Daniel, I also know you're doing work right now that's doing that. Yeah, we are. We're trying. And you know, I, I don't think an online community will ever be a replacement for, you know, flesh and blood community. Um, but it can be, it is a preparatory thing for when when things are open up again, and also something to help us get through the current pandemic. So um, especially in light of George Floyd, we have been doing with Orchestras Canada, some sessions for black musicians across Canada, black orchestra musicians, just to get together and talk, because we don't really know who we all are basically, and there really are not that many of us at all. There's um, one other professional black conductor, Larry Strawn in Winnipeg, and then there's uh, one more in Hamilton. So there's not, there's not very, very many of us. We've been trying to build community in the, um, in the BIPOC community, getting professional orchestral musicians together just to know who each other are and be, start talking with each other. You know, that's been one of the things that's been really important in the pandemic for me. And then also, I would say as well too, like on, in terms of the queer the queer experience during the pandemic, I mean, um, you have laws that came like especially early in the pandemic where they said, okay, you can only be with one family. Well, what if you're a single person and you don't have a family, or your family isn't talking to you because they because of whatever reason they don't believe that you're part of the family because you're queer, or you're gay, or you're trans, or you're lesbian? Um, that's a real thing. But where is there any mention of that in like like how are we supposed to be taking care? of ourselves or um <laughs> when uh recently we were locked down and or we went back to stage two and they said uh you can either be with with your family or if you're a single person you have i think within the next two days you have to find like one other person to quarantine with for the next month and it's like oh great so now i have like 24 hours to find a long-term relationship perfect great yeah because i wasn't working <laughs> on that before and, I, and it was really, you know you know you know so it's, it's just interesting when you're not part of the okay and, and like, 
what what are people like what are the what are the lawmakers supposed to do it's a pandemic and everybody's improvising okay so fine fine right but it's interesting when you're not part of the of the majority how these things sound different and how it's like because it's like what am i going to do who can i go and be with how do i find a bubble how do i negotiate that how do you it's really um it's different so i think the pandemic has been very difficult for queer communities uh, and a lot of my queer, and I'm, when I say queer communities, I'm talking about like me and my like six friends that are talking like, this is BS. How are we going to survive mentally through this? Um, so we've had to build community like on, we've had, we just have to be, we've had to have been uh, improvisatory and ingenuitive and imaginative about our solutions. So yeah, <laughs> end of rent. <laughs> hey, and, and a lot of the work, I mean, um, and Daniel, you're working very hard to uh, bring these virtual performances essentially to i assume that the horror film is going to be streamed to your audience in from toronto and yeah um, everywhere so that's part of the community building as well so absolutely you know with everything that we're putting out we have a lot of resources uh watch guides so disruptor conductor on the tso tso.ca slash education there's tso.ca website there's a watch party guide so if you want to with your friends you can watch the disruptor conductor documentary and then discuss questions about um you know about, about what you've seen. It's a question put together there. Same thing for the uh, for the horror movie concert that we're putting on tomorrow for the next week, uh, which you can watch in the United States as well too. It's not it's not landlocked. Um, there's a discussion guide for teachers and a discussion guide and questions about you know horror movie and music and all this sort of stuff like that. The importance of sound to the concert and movie experience. Yeah, it's all about getting people talking and engaging with what they're experiencing in the moment. And I, I have a question. Um... For Sharon, so I heard a rumor that uh, on this concert, Thorgy had played the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, and it was fire. It was like it was an awesome rendition of this concerto. Apparently, and I heard from all my friends in Toronto. That's what I heard this from. But I'm wondering, how do you choose what music makes it to the final cut? Is the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto from Thorgy on the cutting room floor somewhere? <laughs> in a release somewhere, I don't know. Oh, it's so painful. Oh. It's so painful. We have <laughs> so much amazing footage. And really that was the hardest part. I know all filmmakers say that, but that actually was the hardest part of this film. We have so many um, great performances from Thorgy that we weren't able to put in there. Great from performances from Daniel that we weren't able to put in there. Um, what happens is, our broadcaster, which at that time is CBC, which is sort of like Canadian PBS, um, they have a very specific story they want to tell. And that story is from Daniel's point of view, uh, which is why it's called POV. And the focus is on what Daniel is doing with these concerts. So knowing that that's the focus, that's what uh, what drives the decisions to, to cut things. But I mean, I would love to do a behind the scenes release or a big <laughs> director's version, you know, director's cut where I could include all that in yeah. there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Included all my dirty looks and all my angry moments. Oh. Mm -hmm. There was a <laughs> where he disliked me greatly. <laughs> but that's all right. That's okay. In the end, um, in the end, he was really happy. Yeah. Very, I, I, I think it's just great. I'm yeah. so happy with it, yeah. And John, we love that you love our film and we love that you appreciate the challenges that it took to bring an orchestra and a drag show together and um, and just how important it is that music is seen outside of our sphere. You know, with everything going on in the world, it's sort of a metaphor. Like if you can open yourself up to music, like maybe you can open yourself up to other points of view and other things that are going on. Exactly. And oh, we're also getting from Karen. Yes, yes, a behind the scenes film. I mean, my, I, oh, I mean, you could just release it as a, a full concert. And I would, the, the streaming, all I would, I would watch that. That, would, yeah. that sounds like so much fun. Um, but uh, sure. So I will, this is a question for Daniel. What is it like to have a film made about you? Uh, it's initially terrifying and then it's surreal. And then it ends up being a very happy thing. I mean, in, in, the, in this occasion, um, I was very scared at the beginning because, you know, as a conductor, the goal is Deutsche Grammophon. You said no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you said no. I did say no a lot. Yeah, it's true. But you're, you're always afraid of how you're going to be portrayed and if people will take you seriously. 
uh, you know, as a conductor, the, the goal is we're trained in music school um, and not necessarily wrongly to want to conduct Beethoven nine cycle with, uh, with, with Berlin recorded by Deutsche Grammophon. That's the goal. That's the goal, right? So it's like, do I want people to know that I did a concert uh, of, of drag? Do I want people to see me teaching students? Because then they'll think that I'm just a teacher and then da 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 So at the beginning, and Sharon, uh, Sharon can talk, talk about this. I was just like, no, no, like it has to be this, portray me like this. Like I'm going to be, you know, I am the German uh, conductor of the German music und ich will not Beethoven und alles machen. Ja. Um, I, I wanted really to be portrayed like that. But then it basically the documentary helped me become more myself and become more comfortable with myself. Cause I was like, you know what? I started, I taught music. I taught band, junior high band for 10 years. And if somebody doesn't want me to conduct the orchestra because I was a teacher first, well then I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be there. It's not going to be a good fit. And I really, really enjoyed doing prison concerts. And if somebody doesn't like that, it's not a good fit. And I, if I'm going to conduct Black Panther, you bet I'm going to like work out and like do keto to be able to fit into a Black Panther concert so that I can like show that costume. And if somebody doesn't like that, I'm going to like go all out for whatever I do like that. That's okay. I'm going to, but I'm not going to let it stop me from doing what I want to do. I wasn't like, I wasn't talking like this a year and a half ago. That's Sharon, <laughs> right? And Sharon, am I lying? No, no, it's true. And I think that, um, I think when you watch the documentary, you'll see that journey. You'll see a bit of that journey that Daniel comes into himself more and more as he gets more and more comfortable with what he's doing and obviously with us being there. And I think that's why for us, the Thorgy concert comes at the end of that journey because it's sort of a melding of all of who Daniel is. And there's a lot of pressure. I mean, like I think one of the big pressure moments is conducting San Francisco Symphony, the entire San Francisco Symphony for the first, uh, it was like the fourth concert with him, but this is the first time I had the entire orchestra in a concert for a doc with a documentary crew there, watching everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, for a documentary that's gonna go around North America. <laughs> there were some moments of just like deep, very, very deep breathing and just trying to relax. It was pretty intense, so yeah. Well, the final was so amazing. I, I loved, loved, loved it. And so do all the fans that are in the chat. Uh, people are curious, like, what happens next? Where can we follow for more information on Disruptor Conductor? Um, plug the Instagram handles. Give us everything you need, Sharon and Daniel. I know we're kind of at the halfway or the half hour mark, so we'll probably start wrapping it up. But um, where well, can we find more info on the film? Sure. There's a website, disruptorconductor.com. So definitely go to disruptorconductor.com. And that's where you can find out what next film festival it's in. Maybe the behind the scenes, which I would love to do and release a behind the scenes. Um, and find out more about Daniel and what he's doing yep. as well. And my website's danielbartholomewpoiser.com. Um, and I'm on Instagram too. So Instagram is the best place where I'm posting most of the stuff, danielbartholomewpoiser.com. And just get in touch and say hi. Excellent. Well, Excellent. thank you. Thank you both so much for joining this Q&A session. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Canadian consulate, the Canadian consulate of Seattle who supported this screening and oh, hope yeah. you guys have a wonderful, safe end to your weekend. Thank you so much. This is such an amazing film. Um, you guys must be very, very proud. Thanks Thank so much, you John. so much. Thank you very, very much. Thanks cool. again for having us. And I hope you all enjoy it. And please like hit up our website, give us comments, follow Daniel, let us know what you think. Yeah. Ask for Thorgy. And I hope to see you. <laughs> I'll try and I'll try and be clear. I'll try and be clear. Oh, you <laughs> you are so clear in the film. I'm like, dang, I would what would I give for a conductor as clear as that? Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try, I'll try and stay clear. I'll try and stay clear. Okay. okay. Awesome. Bye, y'all. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks, Thanks so much. Take care. Bye,